everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Virtual Gaithersburg Book Festival. I'm Phil Kaminsky, and I'm your host for tonight's wonderful picture book presentation. Before we get started, however, I'd like to ask you to please consider supporting these authors by purchasing their books from our wonderful bookseller partner, Politics and Prose. You'll find purchase links in the presentation description. It's more important than ever to support local and independent stores. Furthermore, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our 2021 featured sponsor, the David and Michael Blair Family Foundation for all of their generous support. Alrighty, on to the main event. How do successful picture book authors turn their inspiration into a book? These award-winning authors and illustrators share their stories and talents with us today. From author and illustrator Elisha Cooper comes Yes and No, a timeless tale of friendship. Join a cat and a puppy throughout their day, the ups of being fed and romping through the grass and the downs of days that are too short and things that don't go as planned. As they realize that sometimes the very best thing that can happen is just being together. Elisha Cooper is the 2018 Caldecott Honor winning artist of Big Cat, Little Cat, and the author and illustrator of many other books for young readers, including Train, Farm, Beach, Eight, An Animal Alphabet, and River. Sunrise Summer is a picture book by writer Matthew Swanson and illustrator Robbie Bear that celebrates self-confidence and empowerment. When a girl and her family travel 4,000 miles from home, it's not your typical summer vacation. Everything is different on the Alaskan tundra where grizzly bears roam and sockeye salmon swim. When Matthew Swanson and Robbie Bear aren't making books such as Babies Ruin Everything, Everywhere Wonder, and the Real McCoys series, they are raising their four children and running a commercial salmon fishing operation on the Alaskan tundra, where Robbie has spent every summer since she was two years old. Award-winning author and illustrator Susan Stockdale welcomes you to Bird Show, showcasing nature's most dazzling colors, diverse patterns, and fashionable feathered features of the world's most spectacular birds. Susan Stockdale is the author and illustrator of critically acclaimed picture books that celebrate nature. Her books have won a variety of awards, including the ALSC Notable Children's Book, NCTE Notable Children's Books in Language Arts, NSTA Outstanding Science Trade Books for Students K through 12, and the Bank Street College of Education Best Children's Books of the Year. In the Little Things, a story about acts of kindness by Christian Trimmer. One girl's simple act of kindness causes ripples in her community in a witty, heartwarming story about paying it forward. Full of humor, heart, and proof of the generosity that we all have inside of us. This story is a welcome reminder that it's the little things that make a big difference. Christian is a writer and the editorial director at the Henry Holt Books for Young Readers. His books include Teddy's Favorite Toy and Snow Pony and the Seven Miniature Ponies. Christian has contributed posts on the topics of LGBTQ bullying and being biracial to the Children's Book Council diversity blog and strives to perform at least one act of kindness every single day. Moderating today's author panel is Ellie Bloomberg. Ellie is a bookseller in the children and teens department at Politics and Prose Independent Bookstore. She is passionate about promoting books that portray a wide range of identities and experiences, and she loves talking to kids and teens about what makes their favorite stories magical. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Phil. I really appreciate it. And I'm so excited and honored to be here with these amazing authors and illustrators. I've been looking forward to this for so long. Uh, and I think the coolest thing right now would be to have everybody introduce us to their books and their work individually, uh, just sort of give us an idea of what's in these amazing new books and their process and the way they did them. And we can start with Elijah Cooper. So I guess actually my cat is gonna help me share this book. <laughs> the cat's right over there. 
But this, this book is basically about a, a puppy and a cat. And the, and the puppy is this, this young guy who wants to say yes to everything. And the, the cat's kind of a bit curmudgeonly, big word for just saying no, it says never. And they wants to go outside. The puppy wants to play. The puppy uh, goes out, says again, yes to all the options of play. And while well, he doesn't say anything when he's peeing or pooping here, but um, goes out into this the beautiful yard, but then kind of annoys us, the narrator who's asking the questions of these, this cat and the dog, what do they want to do? And finally says enough. And they kind of have to go and find some quiet. So they kind of go off into their world together and they sort of link up and Mm -hmm. Let's find some peace in a way, which is kind of what my mm. kind of climb the hill and I had a lot of fun with this book because it, it was kind of adding color to the black and white of Big Cat, Little Cat. And I kind of threw on a lot of you know references from going up to the Met and drawing a lot of these impressionist paintings that kind of, kind of French impressionist paintings. Mm. And they kind of see their world. And then Kind of the big reveal of the book is that, you know, when it's time to come in, the puppy doesn't want to come in. And so the puppy is saying no. And they come back. Because that, that, that's sort of what it felt like to me growing up on a farm in Connecticut where I grew up. And I was always, you know, I never wanted to come in at the end of the day. Hmm. Anyway, and so we kind of come towards the end where, you know, did you have a good day? Yes and no. The day was good. But now it's done. And then we kind of have some words of comfort, I suppose. And then we have the same question that, well, sort of begun the, began the book, which is, you know, are you ready for the day? And now it's good night, good night. Are you ready to sleep? And now our puppy is ready to sleep. Yes. No. Hmm. And off goes the cat. And I think, Ellie, I just surprised you. <laughs> Did I surprise you? I'm sorry. Right. I have read the book before, but the twist gets me every time. <laughs> oh, there we go. So there it is. It, it's, it's, it's supposed to be a simple book, yes and no, but it's actually not. And um, I think we're probably going to talk about this today, but, you know, children's books are deceptively simple. They're not simple. They're actually very complicated and take a lot of work. And so this book, it tries to kind of like play with simplicity, but then kind of give you something more. So that's yes and no. I love it so much. It's there's so many reveals and so many details on every page. You could honestly spend hours just looking at all of the all of the silent dialogue between the dog and the cat. Uh, and I was sort of wondering how you thought about what to put on each page, how you decided how many words to use, when to use just images to communicate what you wanted to say, and when you put words in. Well, what I love about being both the illustrator and the authors I can, or whatever, the, doing the words and doing the drawings, I can play with those together. And I think it, I'm always impressed when people actually have to have two people working those things. Cause I actually like that balance of playing with, um, between the two. I think for me, yeah, sometimes you just want just an image to let that take over, but then sometimes you want the words. Um, but again, I was just talking about this being, it looks simple, but it's not there were pages where it was just a few words where like the, the, we're saying, what are you doing to this, to the puppy? And we kind of were going back and forth, my editor and I on that phrase forever. And so I think that just the amount of work that goes into kind of getting that balance, when do you have an image? When do you have a sentence? Because again, you know, sometimes you don't need to have a sentence and kind of getting it right is kind of the kind of the playfulness that is great with children's books, kind of getting those two knocking against each other. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite thing about this particular book? My favorite thing. My favorite thing is that, um, oh my God, that's, that's an impossible question. <laughs> um, but I would say this, I mean, my favorite thing was that I, I had made this terrible mistake when I was painting this book, because I usually don't use ink, I usually just use pencil. And I made this mistake where I was actually painting on the wrong side of the paper. I didn't realize that paper is like treated on one side or the other. So half of my paintings were coming out terrible and wrong. I actually wrote an essay about this in Publishers Weekly. And I'm saying this because once I realized how stupid I'd been or how kind of just 
I just didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how I was screwing up. Once I realized that, that was my favorite thing, was kind of getting through it. And it says to me also is that in making books, books are messy. You know, we look at these finished things. Here's this finished book. It looks all done, but it's a mess going through it. You know, you have to, oh, how do these words work with the, with the images? And how does it take so much editing and so much work and so much kind of deliberation that getting through it is probably the best thing. So again, I made a huge mistake and I threw away so many, look around, this is where I paint, I'm at my desk now. And my, my apartment was covered with ripped up paintings that I just, I was crying and my daughters were having to put up with me. And it was a struggle, this book was a struggle. So my favorite thing about this book was finishing it. <laughs> One more question is, readers might notice a little surprise with this book, which I also have here. Uh, when you take the jacket off, when you take their faces off for a second, there is a surprise, the garden and backyard at night. Why yep. this particular scene as a fun surprise for the reader? Well, two things. One is I think that I love cases and I love the whole process of designing a book. You know, we're talking about words we're, and we're going to talk today about how they interact with the art. And I think it's the design is that it's kind of where, the, where those two things meet. And for me, the case is very important because at the top right here, you know, it's this kind of lovely opportunity to show colors coming together. And this was actually two things. One is this was inspired because I wanted this book, you know, I, you want books to be read and to jump off shelves. And actually here, I'm going to show it. I was inspired by this Italian tuna can. And I liked the colors of the kind of orange and blue. And I wanted this to kind of get that across. I saw this in a supermarket and I was like, this is beautiful. And so it was really about color, but then what I want the case to do is give something extra to a kid or any of us when we're looking at the book. And for me, it was showing the geography where this thing takes place to show the route that the dog and cat take as they go up the hill and they get in trouble in the pond and they go under the tree. And there are all these kind of things that I want people to kind of take away where they kind of dig deeper. And so I wanted to kind of show our reader or me just where we are and give kind of a location to a book. Because even though this is sort of a fictional book, I'm at heart a nonfiction children's book writer. You know, I, most of my books have been like from river to train to, you know, beach are all about places and the outdoors and where we are. And so it was kind of important for me to ground the book in place. And I like the cases again, kind of the way you can kind of give a little extra to a book. That makes sense. That's so cool. Thank you so much for sharing your book and your insights with us. This is awesome. I'm so excited to talk more about it. Thank you. And we will move on to our next guests, uh, Matthew Swanson and Robbie Bear, who have done Sunrise Summer. And it is absolutely a gorgeous look at fishing in Alaska. Please tell us about it. Hello, I'm Matthew Swanson. I'm the author of Sunrise Summer. I'm Robbie Bear, and I'm the illustrator of Sunrise Summer. I also am a little bit of a star of Sunrise Summer. That's true. Sun Sunrise Summer mm -hmm. is, a, is a true-ish story. It is yes. about Robbie's summers as a commercial salmon fisherman since she was 18 months old. Yes. Can we go to the screen share so we can show them to share a the very screen. impressive photograph? Um, yes. Prepare to be impressed. If you're not sitting down already, sit down now. This is not an impressive photograph. Oh, no. Okay. Clear your jets. All right. That's just my desk. Already impressed. All right. Here we go. All right. All right. Um, oh, oh, that's oh this, our book. this is the book. The but book but take about. a look at that lovely lady on the left. Yes. And now flash forward to look, this photograph. There I oh go. my goodness. That's what I look like every summer. I've got a wool hat on. I'm holding a fish. And she smells terrible. I smell okay? terrible. All summer long, we smell bad because fish slime is stinky. So let's fast, let's go back 43 years in the, in yes, the past. In the past. Here is Robbie. This is me yes. with my mom and my older sister and older brother. She's this the smallest one. Our very first <laughs> summer um, fishing on the tundra in Alaska. Robbie's so, dad is, is a crazy entrepreneur. Yes. Bought this piece of land in Alaska, yes. sight unseen, dragged everybody up there. And we've been doing it ever since. So we have to travel 4,000 miles from our home in Maryland mm -hmm. to get there. It takes four flights. We have to sleep on the floor of the airport. We we're up about as far as we possibly could be from our <laughs> from our, our homestead in, in Coffee Point. Very inconvenient located. Yes. But this is actually the story of our daughter, Alden, who's yeah. 13 now. But when she was six years old, she started coming down and watching us fish. And then when she was around nine years old, she started being a part of the fishing crew. She was driving the four-wheeler. She was down there in the mud, pulling the fish out of the nets. So this is her story yes. of making that transition from being a kid in Alaska. I mean, I said I was a star in this story. I'm a 
am a sort of a secondary character I, and in you, the mom. I get relegated to a yeah. very small role in this book. <laughs> I, I do very uh, unimportant things. I, I feel a little slighted by That's it. That's because but, I was the illustrator. Yeah. I got to put Matthew wherever I want. All right, we're going to read you a few pages. <laughs> yes. just, okay. Just so starting out. Robbie's, I, I wrote this book, but mm -hmm. Robbie gets to read it because it's her story. So, okay. All right. So here so we, we go. So we start out at our home in Maryland. This is our barn. That's where we yeah, live. This is yeah. where we are right okay. now. Um, all right, it's summer again, my favorite time of year. Some families pack swimsuits and sandals when they go on vacation. Mine packs onions and potatoes, also doorknobs and batteries and spark plugs for a Ford F-150. Our trip takes two days and four flights and 4,000 miles. It's summer again. So we're headed to Alaska. Some beaches have boardwalks and lifeguards and smooth white sand. Our beach has pebbles and mud and upside down jellyfish. Last summer, I picked tundra berries and made forts in Mole Kingdom. Last summer, I sat in the truck bed watching the fishing crew fish. This summer, I will join the fishing crew. That's me over there in the corner with the baby, like yanking on my leg, yes, holding that net, saying, what's going on here? That is in the far <laughs> distance. Robbie's looking heroic, pointing. <laughs> <laughs> While my brothers chase lemmings on the tundra and leap from rusted truck beds on the bluff and search for agates at the waterline, I will help twist six foot anchor poles into the sand. I will drag endless ropes through knee deep mud I will fetch water from the spring of Poppy Point. All right. That's just the beginning. There's That's much more of this book. To give you guys a taste. We want to keep you yeah. just on the edge of your seat wondering yes. what happens next. At the very end of this book also, there's a couple of pages devoted yes. to talking about oh. the history of the fishing, talking about the native people, talking about how it actually works. So yeah. there's some fun stuff at the end that kind of gives you a good sense of what Fishing is actually like, and there I am again. There's little me. Wow, so that, um, because Robbie's a star. Robbie's a star of the book. So <laughs> anyway, I care we're about. excited to share this book with you, friends. Um, Ellie, there you go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for giving us a Thank chance. Thank you for the intro. Heck yes. Literally, of course, this book is awesome. And I learned so much about fishing and about Alaska and about how large fish are. They're big. It's scary how big they are. I'm impressed that people are not terrified of fish. <laughs> Once so, you've seen like 10,000 of them, you're just kind of like... Robbie's karma is bad. I have She's killed a lot of fish. Yeah, yeah, I gotta yeah. do something. <laughs> so what was it like translating your experience uh, for both of you? Was it like translating it from real life to the page? It was, first of all, the, the tricky part was convincing Robbie that this story was interesting enough to tell because she's been doing it for so long. She refused to believe that this was something that people would want to read about. Um, even though whenever we are anywhere, people want to hear about this adventure because yeah. it's so far distant from most people's experience. For me, the challenge was that I know it so well. And there are so many interesting, tiny details that trying to write a story that just has enough of them to be interesting, but doesn't overwhelm the reader of a picture book. So it really wasn't deciding what not to include was it was hardest for me. Um, my editor and I did four different, completely different versions of this book before we settled into one that we thought told the right story about my daughter's and experience. We just reminiscing about this with our editor. Yeah. And she was saying, do you remember the first version of this book? The first version of this book was entirely about getting there. The trip is so interesting. <laughs> the trip itself, the packing and getting there. She that... said, I was like, you would, that takes like one page in this book. Yeah. Please move on and get to the actual yeah. part of the fish. So. Yeah. <laughs> and the other challenge was that when you're telling a story about your own family and your own life, there is a temptation to get too close to it. And she at a certain point said, Matthew, pretend like this is a story about someone else because you need to have enough emotional distance to tell this story as you would an author and not as a father. So for me, that was another thing I had to be reminded of. For Robbie, I don't know, the challenge of capturing this place you know so well. Yeah, um, you know, illustrating anything is hard. The great thing is, is that you get, as an illustrator, you get to do a lot of interpreting. It's not like I had to make it look photographically identical. And that was actually part of, luckily, the way that I illustrate is always, you know, a lot looser and there's people don't have elbows sometimes and you know I'm not, I'm not exactly precise with my illustration so it actually helped um with this because i i got to change things around but i did 
end up using a lot of photo reference, a lot more than I usually do because I had photo reference. I spent so. the entire summer before Robbie illustrated this book. Taking photos. In my waders, in the waves, taking photographs of Robbie, getting yelled at by her brother for not helping <laughs> with the fishing and instead photographing yes. the fishing. So I took some <laughs> heroic hits to make this book happen. All in the name of art. Yeah. <laughs> You're making them all famous. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm not sure they appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> And Robbie, was it, uh, do you feel like having been there as a kid helped you capture the images for kid readers? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's such an ingrained sort of place for me that my concern was always whether I was doing it justice, I think. Mm -hmm. And that was always really hard to kind of really keep tweaking and tweaking until it, it, it felt right. And sometimes it could look right, but not feel right. So it was um, an interesting, kind of balance of representing it, but also capturing sort of, it's such, a, it's such a wide open kind of wild space that is really dependent on like wind, like wind is very much a part of it. And I needed to try to capture that in a way that, and seagulls, like lots of seagulls flying over, there's lots of sort of ambient feel that um, was hard to make sure that I got right. We're going to take so copies cool. up there this summer and we'll see if the people from there think yes. we pulled it off. They might Fingers be like, crossed. Heck yeah. That's terrible, Robbie. Yeah. This is not what it looks like. With people who live when you were doing the book. What's that? We got oh, it. did you all consult with people from Poppy Point or surrounding areas? Um, you, you, you consulted with the I consulted to do the back matter. I actually consulted with the um, Native Council that is in Iggy Gig, which is the town that's sort of across the way from across the river from us um, for a little bit of the historical stuff. But other than that, I mean, no, I didn't. <laughs> no, I mean, you know it pretty well. You yeah, are one of the- about yeah, about us and our particular 40 years of experience. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm an old timer. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely felt the wind. I feel like I could hear the book too. So you definitely, y'all did an amazing job. I feel like oh, I've- Thank you. Yeah, it's such a beautiful and wild and empowering book. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all so much for sharing it with us. Yeah. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to talk more about it. Now we'll go to Susan Stockdale, seasoned author of many books about nature, including Bird Show, which I am obsessed with. Thank you so much for being here, Susan. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you so much. Uh, so I thought I would share my screen to uh, present a few pages of this book to you. So this is my book, Bird Show, which was inspired by a beautiful red cardinal that was swooping around me outside in my backyard and it looked to me like it was wearing a coat which gave me the idea to create a book in which I imagine birds plumage as items of clothing so that is bird show so this is the African uh, the gray crowned crane that you see on the cover which is an African bird I soar through the sky and like birds everywhere I'm decked out in feathers and wear them with flair I boast an outfit of every hue. My coat has one color. My jacket has two. I sport a vest that is dappled with dots. My suit has white speckles. My headdress has spots. So the book continues with many, many more birds. Um, you can see very, it's very playful, had fun. The very end says, all of us dress in our own special way and put on a fashion show every day. Mm -hmm. At the end of my books, I always have an addendum in which I um, identify um, all the animals, tell a little bit about them and where they live, their natural habitat. So that's a real researchy part. I work really closely with ornithologists on this book. And then lastly, I have a matching game. Can you find the birds that belong to these colors and patterns? So I started out my art career as a textile designer for women's clothing, for women's apparel. And I'm a pattern nut. I just love patterns. So of course this book is all about patterning, but pattern recognition is so important for kids. It's the foundation of math. It's also a ton of fun. And this is kind of a game. I think it's, it's a fun way to get kids back in the book and um, you know practicing pattern recognition. So I shall stop sharing my screen here and... Um, and chat with you. Heck yeah, thank you so much for sharing your book. Those are extremely cool birds. Thank you. <laughs> One thing I love about it is it's kind of hard not to turn it into a song when you're reading it aloud because <laughs> it rhymes and flows so well. How many 
crafts does that take you? How do you, how do you accomplish that effect? It's so funny you asked that because I thought I'm going to find my first draft of this book. Okay, let's see if you can see this. What a mess this thing is. Oh my <laughs> gosh. It's I had beautiful. about 15 drafts of this thing. What I really, because I do, you know, picture books for really young kids. I mean, like zero to six. I, I really love spare text. And so obviously each word choice is really, really important. Um, it's for me, it's, it's kind of a marriage between, you know, what are spectacular birds to show kids and how can I write about them in a way that I think is evocative? Um, I had, you know, I usually come up with lists of candidates. I think I had like three pages of candidates, birds that I might choose. But then if I can't find the right words that I think are sparkly and engaging, out they go. Um, I'll give you one example. I love the great egret. It's such a beautiful bird. Here's the great egret. Nice. And it's got these wonderful feathers. But my line of text says, I flaunt a full skirt of milky white lace. Now, I really like that line. So I wasn't going to get rid of that bird. I really want to get that bird. <laughs> so, um, I mean, for all of us who are, you know, creating, you, you, want it, you want it to be a tight conceit. You want it to, all the parts to work. And um, so, yeah, lots of drafts, you know, like, like every writer, you know, lots of edits and trying to make it as, as engaging and fun as possible. Uh, the colors and stuff are so bold and the illustration style is pretty unique. Uh, what do you, what do you use? Right, you know, I probably can share my screen again. I'll show you. I do have one sequence that I can show pretty quickly. Um, so this is the, the Northern Flicker, which is a really incredible woodpecker. Um, so I look at photo references. Of course, I try to see these birds where they live when I can. Actually, when I was reading, doing this illustration or right before it, I'm not making this up. I thought this tapping up my window in my family room and it was a Northern Flicker. How amazing is <laughs> that? And it was like spread its wings. I was like, I can't believe that's happening. I'm definitely gonna include that book in the bird in the book. Okay, so I look at a reference like that. I do, I do everything um, sort of by hand. So I just do pencil on paper and I paint acrylic on, on Bristol paper. So I started in the upper right. You can see I have a diagonal bird coming in. That's as far as I got. I knew I wanted the diagonal um, entrance. I think that adds sort of dynamism. Um, then I decided on the left-hand side, I thought, well, this is a picture in which I'm going to show the bird. It's going to be bringing an ant, which they eat, they forge on the floor for food, which is very unusual for a woodpecker. And I'll have an ant or something in its mouth, and we're going to bring, you know, something to its chick. Um, and then I transfer it to tracing paper, which as you see up above, why it's dark behind is that's transfer paper behind my traced image. And behind the transfer paper is my Bristol paper, which is what you see down below. That is my final image down below that I'm now going to Treat as a coloring book, essentially. And I begin blocking in the colors. So down below, I have my acrylic paints. I have my, you know, all the paints that I'm mixing as I go along. And on the right is the most dynamic part for me because it's actually mixing the colors before I apply them to make sure I'm happy. And then there's the final illustration. And of course, the words, a lot of people ask me when I go to schools, like, did I put the words in? And no, I leave space for the words. But of course, they're going to get added when the book gets printed. So that gives you an idea of, of the process. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. <laughs> so cool. Um, what made you want to do science books specifically? Um, you know, I grew up in Miami, Florida, and because it was warm outside, I, I was just outside my entire childhood. Other than the time I was in school, I was playing outside, you know, with incredible, you know, subtropical flowers and birds and skittering lizards. And I, um, I'm kind of sad that kids are inside all the time these days. I feel like <laughs> You know, I don't want to be on this like mission to get kids outside, but I think it's really great to celebrate our incredible natural world and hopefully make kids more eager to kind of go out and see what's out there. So um, I, I, nature's always my muse. That's sort of some reason I just get my ideas for, for um, you know, for books about flora and fauna. And I'm grateful that they come to me. <laughs> <laughs> they literally come to you in the case of that bird. Right, exactly. <laughs> cool. Exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Susan, thank you so much for sharing all this. I'm so excited to talk about your book more. And moving on to Christian Trimmer, author of the amazing new picture book, The Little Things, A Story of Small Acts of Kindness. And here you are, Christian. Thank you so much, Ellie. Thanks for having me, Gaithersburg. I did a little research before joining the, the conference, and I'm in Hillsdale, New York. I'm sitting in my living room. And Hillsdale, New York, if I got into my car and I drove down to you, it would take me six hours. So pretty far, right? And then I looked up like, well, how long would it take me to walk? It would take a hundred hours <laughs> if I walk fast. 
And that's like, <laughs> if I did some quick math, that's more than four days if I walked all day, all night. So it's a little pretty far. So I'm so glad I get to see you. So glad to be here with you. As Ellie said, I have a new book called The Little Things. And it's by me, I wrote the words, and then Keilani Juanita did the beautiful, beautiful art. It's so good, I'm so in love with it. And the story is about acts of kindness. And it's not about only acts of kindness between people, but also acts of kindness toward animals and acts of kindness toward the planet. So I think there's many ways for us to be kind. But the, the, the part of the story really is that our acts of kindness the acts of kindness that all of you do every day can inspire others to perform acts of kindness. And that's the real power. And so when I was writing this story, I was remembering being a kid and, and seeing people be kind and being like, gosh, that makes me want to be kind. And so I hope when you read the story or hear the story that you're inspired to do acts of kindness because that's how kindness spreads. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from it. So the story begins with a little girl saving some sea stars. But I'm going to jump a little bit ahead and an old man has um, going to adopt a dog, even though there are a bunch of dogs that need help. So that's where we begin. What are we doing here, Grandpa? Asked the little boy. I'm going to rescue a dog, the old man replied. The boy looked around. There were many animals who needed rescuing after the store. Taking home one dog isn't going to make much of a difference, he said. See all these dogs, and all these, everyone needs to be rescued. That may be so, his grandpa said, but it sure will make a difference to this little guy, don't you think? The little boy had to admit his grandpa had a point. And so you see the dog is very excited to be going home. The next day, after a lunch of buttered noodles, the boy headed to his neighbor's house. There lived an elderly lady who had once been a professional dancer and who loved butterflies. I'm here to clean up your garden, the little boy said to the elderly lady. The storm had torn up her flower beds and tossed garbage all over her yard. Well, that would be lovely, replied the elderly lady doing a graceful plie. See her down there? A plie is when you bend your knees really low. It's a dance term, it's French. <laughs> As the little boy worked, a teenager who listened to classical, mu classical music very loudly on her headphones and who just couldn't be bothered, happened by. Hey, Kit, she said, taking off her headphones. What are you doing? I'm cleaning up this lady's yard, he replied. Look around, kid. The storm messed up this whole block. What's the point of cleaning one yard? Asked the teenager, even though the kid was doing a good job. Not that she'd ever admit that out loud. And from there, the teenager's inspired to do an act of kindness. And that inspires uh, someone who sees her on the street and then a whole classroom and then a teacher. It just spreads and spreads and spreads until finally at the end of the story, the whole community has come together to perform acts of kindness. And I hope you really like it. I loved writing this one. I loved hearing it. It made me My mustache smile. looks funny on screen. <laughs> I, I just grew it. So you're welcome, Gaithersburg. <laughs> Gaithersburg is the city of the mustache. So <laughs> just in time. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's such a lovely book. It made my heart very warm. And something that really struck me about it is how the acts of kindness spread and spread. So you could definitely see like, where each person realized where they could pick up where someone else left off. And uh, were there any things you saw in real life that sort of inspired that trajectory? Oh gosh, yes. I mean, I wrote this story before the COVID-19 pandemic, but I think all of us here probably have seen how communities have come together to lift one, an one another up. And that has been so inspiring to me. And actually um, the, the winter storm that hit Texas a few months ago that was so inspiring too. I mean, it was such, so devastating, but to see people open up their homes to those who didn't have heat. Um, there was a gentleman who opened his furniture store so that some, that people would have a lot of, uh, a warm bed to sleep on. That's the kind of kindness that is so insp inspiring. And that's the kind of kindness that spreads. Um, but even here where I am in Hillsdale, you know, some people needed help getting groceries and, and we all came together and, um, you know, 
I try to see the light and the dark. And I think through all the stuff that we've been going through this year, like community has really, really come together. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's a community is so huge. And the picture book yeah. definitely captures that. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> the images also really portray a sense of community. They're so warm and lovely. And everyone else here either worked with an illustrator they are personally or know personally. Ugh. I just look at these kids, look at their clothes. I want to wear all of those outfits. <laughs> I know. Kehlani, <laughs> I know I've, I've, I've emailed with Kehlani, but I've never met her. So maybe hopefully um, in the near future, I'll get to meet her, but she did such a beautiful job illustrating um, the book. And for, for the young uh, viewers out there, so uh, Matthew and I, we wrote the words and that's these lucky people like that. And they truly are the luckiest people because they get to illustrate our words. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they bring the stories to life, right? Because I have a, uh, an idea of what the words will look like on the page. When I'm writing stories, I think about, I was like, well, how is this page going to be composed? Um, but then you just sort of like give it over to the artist and you hope like, I wonder what they're going to do with it. And when I saw Kehlani's sketches, I, my mind was like, I just couldn't believe it. It's so good. It's beautiful. What's it yeah. like working with an illustrator from a distance? Well, I hope a lot of you watching will get into the world of picture books. And if you are a writer or are, are an illustrator who doesn't do your own words, that is the norm. You like actually work from a distance. Um, and, you know, I, this is my fifth book and I have met one of the illustrators in real life. And it's only because she also lived in New York. Um, I have a couple more coming out and I, I've met one of those people and the other lives in Australia. So <laughs> maybe, maybe my publisher will send me to Australia to meet her. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of your favorite little details in the book, either in the words or oh, the text for the pictures or both? <laughs> yes. I mean, again, I talked about the fashion. Here's another one. Like, look at that that shade of like that pairing of blue and orange, his top knot is so great. Mm -hmm. um, like all of the kit, like I love the fashion. I like clothes. There's this early page. Oh, this one too. Mm -hmm. So one of the girls has um, a wiggly tooth and you can see like, if you look really closely how, how gapped her teeth are and you see her sort of wiggling her tooth with her other tongue. I remember doing <laughs> that when my teeth were falling out. But Kehlani, <laughs> You know, it's it's a it's a static image, right? Static meaning like it's not moving. But look, it can, can you can like almost hear the bell ringing, the way that the that the lady is shaking that bell. I love those little details. Definitely, so cool. Um, when you were thinking about which acts of kindness to include, uh, how did you? I mean, because like you said, there are so many. There's so many examples of people coming together as a community. Uh, why did you choose these specific examples that you did? Yeah, I, that was tough. And I tried to, to your point, I tried to make it so it felt like the community was coming together. And I, I thought about where I wanted to set the story. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. And when I was a little kid, we would have tornado drills. And so I was like, well, should I set it in a place where tornadoes are common? Because tornadoes are very devastating and there's you need help sort of cleaning it up. But I started writing the story during hurricane season. And, um, and there's a subtle nod to climate change. Like, you know, the story begins and ends with the storms and we're starting to see storms sort of hitting the same places. Um, so I wanted to do that. And I, I just liked this sort of tropical space like near a beach where like a whole community is sort of, I mean, I miss the beach so much, I'm, I'm, in, I'm landlocked. Um, so that's why I decided to set it um, there. And it just sort of made sense to sort of, I wanted, I knew I wanted to talk about people being kind to people, to the planet and to animals. And these are the things when I was doing some research, like they just started popping up in, in certain articles that I was reading. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your book and your insights with us. I am My so excited. Pleasure. Thanks, Ellie. Of course, of course. Shall we move on to a few questions for everybody? I was wondering since you all write and illustrate for young people uh, and you've probably talked to a lot of young people about your work uh, do you have any favorite bits of feedback favorite things or conversations that young people have said to you about your work <laughs> and we can start with you christian 
Oh gosh, because I'm laughing so hard. <laughs> it is, I mean, I've written, um, like I said, this is my fifth book. And this one has um, quite a few words. Um, the longest story I've ever written is uh, called Snow Pony and the Seven Miniature Ponies. That was with Art by Jesse Sima. And that was like 1600 words, a lot of words. We but usually, my, my, thank you. Usually my manuscripts are around like 500 words. And I remember being uh, reading to a kindergarten class and um, I think I was reading Simon's New Bed. And at the end, a kid was like, and I was like, oh yeah, you have a question. He's like, is that the whole story? I was <laughs> like, oh God, <laughs> because they go fast. It goes fast. It's, it's sort of like, you can read them really quickly. Um, but I, I really appreciate that candor. And it inspired me to be like, you know what? Even though a lot of picture books, I think we would all agree on the panel, like a lot of picture books don't have many words. Um, and like what Elijah, what you're doing with your books, like you want to linger on the art and like hopefully you're when you're a kid or you're with an educator or a parent looking at your books, you get to like linger on those and look at the moments and try to figure out what the, the cat and the dog are thinking. Um, but- Thank you so much. Was, what did you say to the kid when he said that to you? I was like, yeah, I mean, I could read, I don't even remember. I was like so perplexed. I was like, well, yeah, that's the whole story. It's like, I, I used, what if I was all, I used the number of words I needed to to tell this story. <laughs> um, but it was a good lesson for me because it encouraged me. It was like, I can put more words on the page and um, and have some fun with that. That was a long answer, but I just remember, I was so impressed by that kid. We did a school visit recently, a uh, virtual visit, and I do a little drawing tutorial and I was teaching the kids sort of a simple way to draw a bear for, um, oh, it was a dog, it was a dog. It was for a different book. It was for Everywhere Wonder. And um, we go through the whole tutorial and everybody shows their pictures and everybody's super happy. And then one kid raises his hand and he says, um, I, there's a balloon in this book. I'd really like you to show me how to draw the balloon, which is a very simple thing to draw. <laughs> and so, and I drew the balloon and he wanted to see how the highlight of the balloon, like how to make the balloon look three dimensional. Mm -hmm. And, um, Question. and that was the biggest hit. I was like, oh, sometimes it's like the simple things, right? It doesn't have to be like something complicated. Sometimes a kid just wants to know how to put the shine on a balloon. Mm -hmm. So that was, <laughs> that was super fun and funny too. In another presentation for that same book in the middle of the presentation, a kid stood up and raised their hand and, and just told, took me to task for not having done very much work. Um, Robbie, <laughs> Robbie had spent a long time drawing all the pictures for this book and he said you only had three words yeah. on that page so I, I no respect no respect for the author to that when I spent time with Robbie yeah so what did, what did you say to that kid I, I told him that I, I just uh, wasn't pulling my weight in the presentation and I felt very bad and I would I would work harder next time I mean no I think I tried to explain what I was you know that, that picture books are about telling a lot with a little, you know, that that's, there's a real art to it. Choosing which words, as Susan was saying, the, the word choice is so important mm -hmm. and letting the illustrations tell the story and really standing back sometimes as the author. I mean, most of the time or a lot of the time I'm writing longer 30,000, uh, 40,000 word uh, middle grade books. That's what I do most of the time. So it's a real challenge for me to switch into picture book mode where I have to really be spare and economical. My favorite comment from a young man at a presentation afterward was coming up and asking me if I was the actor that played Thor in the Marvel movies. So that, <laughs> oh. me, yes, that, I did check to see if that young man was feeling ill that day, but no, <laughs> that's that all we hear about yeah, around here. Now. Yeah, that, that's, that's, my, that's, that's my favorite piece of reader feedback. Not necessarily germane to literature. All right. <laughs> How about you, Elisha? Oh, I don't, I don't take reader feedback. <laughs> You're a smart man. <laughs> no, mostly because um, I used to ask my daughters what they thought about some of my stuff. And uh, now I've learned not to, because now they're teenagers, but they, they were my, they were my harshest critics. No, I, 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 I should say though, that hearing you guys talk about being in schools, I mean, I, I just want to acknowledge that, oh, we want to be back. You know, we want to be visiting with kids and seeing that type of interaction. We've all done virtual events, but we as authors in this community want to be back in bookstores, in schools, seeing people, having that type of interaction safely, but drawing and showing balloons 
and showing how to draw bears and, and having those acts of kindness, those moments between us and our kids who read our books, you know? And, and so I'm, I, it's, I just almost wanna acknowledge how deeply sad this year has been for all of us. And we're, we're looking forward to interacting again because there is a certain joy and I think we all feel this and God, I feel like I'm getting on a high horse here, but there's a joy to read our books in schools because we're, we as authors are kind of alone and we create these things and we have these ideas and we're drawing birds and fishing and, and all these types of things. And then when we are able to come into a place and share them, it is beautiful. And we see that our books are taken in a way that we're not even aware of. Like, oh, they liked this scene or they liked that. It's amazing. Um, and now I'll stop. But I just want to say that this has been a really hard year and we can't wait in a year to be back with kids and in schools and in bookstores. Yeah. And now I'm done. <laughs> I think that's true. I mean, picture, picture books are unusual because you think about theater or something like that where you're experiencing it and, the, and, the, and the, the actors are getting the feedback right away. When people sit down with a picture book, a parent with a child or whatever, it's this private moment and we're not privy to it. We don't see what's going on in that moment. It's so incredible. And then of course, if you get these school visits, you get that interaction with kids. But I guess I'm thinking more about the experience of what happens when your books go into homes or apartment buildings, wherever they go. Um, you know, so it's so, it, it is so um, gratifying when you get a note or an email or something from somebody saying, I, my kid really enjoyed that. You know, and you're like, oh, my books really are out there. People, people appreciate them. <laughs> A nice feeling because because yeah we are so isolated when we're creating them you know they go out there and it's a private moment that people are experiencing absolutely yeah do you have any favorite moments of reader feedback you know i was thinking as you were all talking i was thinking what do i have that's funny to tell about but <laughs> for me i do a lot of focus on um, creating nonfiction and mm -hmm. research that goes into um you know working with different you know mammal experts or ornithologists or whatever and I guess what I appreciate from kids is that um, I talk a lot about mistakes that I make when I'm doing illustrations and I show them. Here was my sketch before I talked to, uh, you know, Dr. Helgen at the Smithsonian and he said, that's not how an a copy stands or, or whatever it is. They, they really like hearing about um, th that I make mistakes and that then you fix them. And then that gives them freedom to feel like, oh, so it's really, I mean, because I say I write things over and over and over again, and they're so awful at the beginning, but that's not the point. You just kind of keep going until you make it better and better and better. And then you get that incredible feeling of like, ooh, that's the best I can do. I think I did that, you know? So, I mean, I, those are the moments, they're not really funny things kids say, but I guess the feedback that, um, just the freedom I hope that I'm kind of con conveying to them that you make mistakes, that's like part of creating, that's like a wonderful thing. And you just kind of keep growing and learning, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of which, um, the process of a picture book, I'm guessing it's so different for everyone because each picture book is so, so different. Uh, tell us a little bit about just like, not from beginning to end necessarily, but the highlights of your process. And we can start with you, Susan. Yeah, I mean, what's I have to say, I've been really lucky to actually go to some places where I've, um, you know, been in, come up with picture book ideas. I mean, I saw a incredible striped poison dart frog in the forest of in rainforest of Costa Rica, which inspired a book called uh, Stripes of All Types about striped animals and how animals. So I guess they, I get the idea like stripes of, okay, a book about striped animals. And then I'm like, what about them? I got home and I was like, what am I gonna say about them? And I thought how they benefit from their stripes. And then I'm gonna put each animal in action in its natural habitat. And I'm gonna have the second and fourth line in each verse rhyme. So to me, I mean, I don't know how you all feel when you're creating, but the tighter the conceit can get, the tighter the idea is, the more to kind of figure out to make it come together, usually the more successful it is, I think, in my mind. I mean, um, so um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, super interesting. What about you, Alicia? Well, now's the time to admit that I don't do any of my work and all of the work is done by... <laughs> but, um, I, I one of those. I need one of those, Elisha. <laughs> this, <is actually> wow. <laughs> this was actually owned by Sendak, and I keep him oh. under my desk, and he kind of stares at my feet. <laughs> and kind of makes me, uh, I don't know, he, he scares me a little. But anyway, so yeah. uh, I don't know. I, I feel, yeah, I come from the same kind of nonfiction school. I think um, we all do, because when you think about it, you know, if you're looking at acts of kindness or 
fishing or birds or anything like that, you are going to a place and thinking about how that thing strikes you and then how to tell a story that is then maybe a kind of a fictional story on the nonfiction. So for me, it's always about going to the place and drawing. And so even if it's my cats who are sleeping over there, I would go over there with my sketchbook and draw them. But, you know, and then I'd come back to my desk and, you know, paint them. Those are, these are my paints that I use that my, my mother gave me this paint box when I was 10. Oh. But, but so it is that process of research. And then for this book, again, you know, I was, I was kind of very interested in, in what impressionists and some of these um, different Chinese mountain paintings were that are up at the Met. So I'd go up to the Met and I would do some research up there and then I come back and paint here. But it really is an idea of going out, sketching the world, coming back, thinking, and then putting it together and then having my ghostwriter do the work for me. Oh, and then running down to Macmillan and, and, and where my editors are and bouncing ideas off them. I, mean, I think that I love you're talking about how messy books are because they really are. It's, 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 we see this finished thing that looks like all bound and good, but you know, the amount of drafts and the mistakes that I made in painting on the wrong side of the paper in this book, it, it's actually important because it's through making those mistakes that you're like, okay, this is better. And at some point you just kind of give up and here's my book. But all of that work, getting the editors, doing the research, it take, it's a mess and it's kind of a beautiful mess. But I, I hope we as authors can convey that to kids is that this is a, this mm -hmm. is a real process. I have so, a question for you, Elijah. Yeah. You, um, you live in New York City, yep. but your book is about sort of this beautiful like um, open spaces and, and the cat and the dog end up, you know, on a hilltop looking out over the scenery. Did you, is that an imagined place? Is that a place that you've been? Is it a place that's close to your heart or? Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, that's a good question. And I sometimes wonder, you know, guys, I, 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 but I did grow up on a farm oh. on a hill. And so, yeah. and the reason I'm kind of laughing about that is because somebody asked that a week ago and they pointed out to me, I was like, oh, you're right. That's so, I've heard this or now I've been thinking about it. But yeah, I think it's because I love nature, but I love nature even in cities. So, you know, the fact that I could, that I could go to the Met and see these beautiful paintings of the French countryside and put those into my book, I'm sure I was thinking about nature, but I love how actually how it interacts with the city. For instance, during this year, I spent a lot of time swimming out at the Rockways, out at the beach. And you'd think, you'd think that that's, well, that's a city and yet nature. I saw a whale swimming a couple of months ago and it was freezing cold and I'm then snowing and there's a way, you know, this was actually before, but it's like, I like how, I'm not answering your question. I'm just talking about whales in the beach. What <laughs> <laughs> <Of> whales? It's <laughs> a story though. <laughs> yeah. I like to bring nature in and I like outdoors and I love those things, but I love living in the city and I write my books in cafes in New York. And so I kind of like the interplay of how these things react. I mean, look, you, I'm getting, you know, you live in Maryland and you're going to Alaska. Mm -hmm. yeah. We all kind of crave a little bit of both. We like human interaction. We like cities, but we like this idea of beauty and being up on a hill and peace or out in the ocean or looking at a bird or any number of these things that are kind of a little bit of both. Now, I'm, am I sort of answering your question now? Sort yeah. Of. No. <laughs> Elisha, I have a question for you too. So do you write your words first and then you do the illustration? Uh, again, this guy does all the, all the writing. Um, but they go- Oh, excuse me. Yeah, no, they go <laughs> I think, so, and we've sort of been circling this and, you know, Robbie and Matt, you know, cause you, Inter you do this together, they come for me at the same time too. Yeah. And so I'm always intrigued by when people have to kind of ping this back and forth, but I bet you have this relationship that maybe you can't even describe, but for me, it just comes, they come together. Yeah, I mean, my, got my, it. My first job out of college, I worked at the New Yorker. And the reason I loved that is because I loved how these, you know, the drawings worked with within the, te the text. And I think that that in a way led me to children's books because that's exactly what's going on. So I can't answer which comes first. Yeah, me, I know. I was just curious because, yeah. <laughs> and that's why I'm fascinated, Christian, that you you have to go meet these people and, and go behind your editor's back and, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and figure those things. 
but because I think actually when they ping against each other, words and images, that's when sometimes this magic happens. And I'm amazed, it's, it's beautiful that you can do that having not met each other. I'm impressed, that's wonderful, but I kind of want people to meet each other so they can have that pinging that is actually right in my head. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because they come at the same time. It's like you look at a bird and you say, here's the adjective to describe the bird as you're drawing it. So for me, it's, anyway, I should punt to the, to you guys, the, the, the team up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, our, our process, we, we, one time we tried writing a book where Robbie went first. We've self-published for about a decade before we got into commercial publishing. Mm -hmm. so we've made about 70 books together self-published. And, and all of those books were actually for adults. So yeah. your interest in that interest in the interplay of words and letting the pictures do part of the work um, has been something that we've been interested in for a long time. And we've always just sat side by side with the manuscript mm -hmm. and brainstormed illustrations together. So I, I too marvel at people who can do it without being in the same space. That said, yeah. the words have always had to come first. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of why I'm an illustrator. Mm -hmm. Like I think when you talk to illustrators, um, one of the things that I realized after looking around for some arts related, like I always loved doing art, but I would, was never sure I was gonna be an illustrator until I kind of realized that I'm not very good at coming up with ideas on my own. I like responding to something that somebody else has put out. And I have a lot to say when I'm reflecting it back at somebody, but I don't have a lot to say just coming from myself. But you also have a lot to say before you start drawing, right? Yes. Because we worked together for 10 years with no editor and art director, mm -hmm. Robbie is my editor and I'm her art director. Oh. So even when we work on our books together now, we are each other's first line of defense. So, yeah. so my process is to write way too many words and then whittle them back. And my process begins with discovering a voice. I can never write a book, whether it's a picture book or a novel without identifying a voice that emerges from some aspect of my twisted interior that is authentic and yet a new character that isn't me. So I think that's probably the challenge of this. This was our first nonfiction. Non -fiction. Yeah. Um, that usually Matthew will just write a whole bunch of stuff mm -hmm. and out of all of that stuff will come some little kernel of some interesting character or mm -hmm. something. And so we were sort of, retrofitting it. We had the story, but we had to turn it into, like we had to strip it down and turn it into a book, which was a lot it was hard. different of a process for yeah. us. I don't think yeah. this is my preferred mode. I'm looking forward to going back. <laughs> I have gone back to hard fiction. I like making stuff up. I like no accountability to truth. <laughs> anyway, well, we should like Christian. Yeah. Go ahead. Tell yes, us. yes, please tell us. Well, in terms of process, I, I, I remember being as I think back to being a kid, like I just didn't understand where books came from. I just thought like someone came up with the words and then suddenly it was a book. Mm -hmm. But now that I've done a few of these, it's sort of like, you know, um, for everyone watching, like now you've met some writers, you've met some illustrators, you've met some author illustrators, but there's so many other things that, that go into the making of a book, right? So like, if we look at the cover, like a designer came up with like those, that lettering and where it was gonna place and like all of this border and like all the words. And then someone has to think about like, well, what kind of paper should we print this on? And where are we gonna find that paper? And how much paper do we need? And that's someone in the production department. I'm a very good speller, so I don't make <laughs> spelling mistakes, but there are people <laughs> who will catch those mistakes and they're called copy editors, right? So the process of the book, it's so fascinating there, even though you're just meeting the, um, it took me that long to count five people, the five <laughs> of us, <laughs> um, there are so many other people that like fit into the process of making a book. And so for anyone out there watching, like it can be, it can be so many things when it comes to books, like we're just showing you a, a couple pads, but there's so many. Um, I'm a very, I, I, I like think in words. I, I do not really, I'm not a very visual person. And yet when I'm writing picture books and I've worked on a bunch, I've not only um, had five published, but I'm in part of my job is editing picture books. So I like look at them all the time. I'm looking at them. So I get to spend time with like the geniuses that you see on your screen. And that was so educational to me. And it is informed like the way I write my, my stories. Cause I can be like, okay, I'm, I'm writing this and I can say like, okay, that means that the girl's on the page and she's in this setting. And then the next page, if I turn the page, now she's moved closer to the water. So I think about all of those things as I'm writing the text, because I, I just have a lot of practice. And I think, again, for everyone watching, like practice, 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 write all the time, draw all the time, read all the time. And you can end up 
sitting in one of these squares <laughs> and, a, and a virtual panel. Yeah. But did you have any, you didn't send any notes about like the fashion, like the clothes that the, your kids were wearing? Not you? No, you know? I mean, Elisha, I'm such like a, I'm, I play by the rules. It's one right. of my strengths and faults. <laughs> so I know because I'm an editor and oftentimes authors and illustrators don't get to meet or talk they sort of go through the editor. And for everyone watching, like an editor is the person who like will help you find the right words or like make sure that the story makes sense or that the, the pictures are telling like a clear narrative. Um, so I try to like, when I'm writing books, um, I try to take a step back because I know that that's the, the role I'm supposed to play. My editor will send me sketches and be like, these are our notes. Do you have any additional thoughts? Mm -hmm. And then I'll weigh in just sometimes on like, you know, I really wanted the girl to be really big on the page. It's important that we see her face and they'll take those notes or sometimes they don't. Um, but it was really Kehlani and like the other illustrators I've worked on, like I just really lucked out, like with all that stuff. Sound much too kind. I think I'd be, I'm, I'm, I'm too controlled. <laughs> well, you have, you know how to do it. You know how to draw. I don't. So I just have to like take what I get. Can I, can I tell you a story of a time I overstepped on this front? Um, so our first graphic or illustrated novel, The Real McCoys, was 37,000 words long. And I took the liberty of going into the document and adding a few notes to Robbie. And in InDesign, of you, what he wanted, uh, of what, just helpful point. ideas, mm -hmm. helpful ideas. <laughs> and there is a way to do a count of the notes field, and I wrote forty-two thousand words of or notes oh. on the thirty-seven thousand <laughs> words of manuscript. And how many of those did you? I probably used about a thousand of those. Uh, at <laughs> most, wow. at most. For for book two, oh. I did not do that. <laughs> no. I said, Robbie, let me know. It's a waste of time. Let me know if you get stuck, <laughs> and otherwise. So guys, no, <laughs> illustrators are fully capable of coming mm -hmm. up with their own ideas. That's what they do. It's their job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're nearing the end of our panel, which is honestly breaking my heart because y'all are amazing to talk to. Uh, <laughs> much better friends to me than the um, point of sale system at work that just beeps <laughs> and I know which beeps are angry and which beeps are happy. Uh, and <laughs> It has been such an honor to talk to you all today. I love your books and I hope readers do too. I know readers will too. Um, and thank you so, so much for joining us today. No, here this come the kitties. And here come the kitties to say goodbye oh, to everybody. Hello, buddy. <laughs> Good friends too, are they? Do they get along well? Chill. Do they ever, ever help you with your books? Well, they, they inspire them, but they also, um, I was throwing the ball earlier and that cat is getting in the way because sometimes he, he does interrupt me, but they, they are, they're deaf. They're my interns. They're my unpaid. <laughs> Cats are the best. Love them. The industry is wild. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you all so much. Any, Thank you, any Ellie. Last... Thanks, Ellie. Nice, yes. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Ellie. Ellie. Good work. You all. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank Bye. you. Bye, friends. Bye-bye. Bye, what wonderful stories. Thank you all so much for sharing your books with us today. Here are today's story starters. Remember, you can choose your favorite one or you can write about them all. Number one, which is better, winter or summer and why? Number two, write a story about your pets and how you take care of them. If you don't have a pet, what type of pet might you like and how would you take care of it? And number three, you're going on a trip to Iceland to see one of the volcanoes. Are you scared? Are you excited? What do you pack for the trip? What do you think you will find when you get there? Send your finished story to gbfstories at gaithersburgmd.gov to be entered into a random drawing for a special prize. And to all of you book lovers watching at home, I have to thank you for joining us tonight for this presentation. We have an amazing lineup of children's authors still to come and you don't wanna miss one. Furthermore, for those of you local to the Gaithersburg area, you have to be sure to check out the four GBF story walks, which are installed all around the city. Go to gaithersburgbookfestival.org and look over the author presentation schedule and story walk locations 
so you can plan the rest of your festival month. Have a great evening all, and remember, keep reading and keep writing.